All right. All right. So we welcome Jay Grossman to class tonight. You guys should have uh, at least done some uh, uh, background research, the link I sent, et cetera, obviously LinkedIn and everything. Um, we got some people whose cameras don't work or right, whatever. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we thank Jay for his time and, and uh, welcome him to the class. Jay, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Good to be back here again. Yeah, it's good to have you back. It's good to see you again. It's been it's been way too long and, and we appreciate you doing this. So I have to ask you, obviously, I know, you know, about, you know, what you've done. And obviously it's front and center I mean, for anybody who wants to read it. But uh, you went to a pretty good hockey college, but didn't play hockey, right? I played a little bit, but I uh, quickly found out that, uh, as the coach said when I first got there, take a good look at the rest of the campus. Wow. And uh, I actually um, uh, ended up having a really good working relationship with him, though, because I came, became a graduate assistant coach, which I did in my junior and senior year. And, um, and it was excellent. It was good. Yeah, so that kind of leads into my question. Um, it seems like maybe coaching was the path that you started to go down. Like, and it was that your original interest area? Yeah, initially it was. And uh, I actually worked, um, I started working uh, with a fellow named Roger Nielsen, who was uh, an NHL coach of eight different teams. Um, and sure. uh, at, the, at the advent of video, uh, football, of course, used film for many, many years, but hockey was a little bit late to develop it. Um, and it, it's amazing to look back on how far that's actually come because now everything's digital and the ability and the ability to, uh, you know, the ability to divide. Sorry about that. Um, the, the ability to divide, um, the 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 film and and the video um nowadays is is just amazing in what in what it can be done to be utilized for scouting development coaching yep. uh et cetera et cetera and i i knew it was going to happen it was just really hard to foresee exactly how it was going to happen how long it was going to take um uh, but that opened some doors I, after that i worked for herb brooks who was the coach of the 1980 U.S. Olympic team uh, who's featured in the, the, the movie Miracle. Sure. And, uh, and, and from there is where I got my start at, in, in the sports agent representation business. Okay. And you started off uh, with, a, with a company that was actually one of the top agencies at the time. And then it, it tell us about all the transitions that ha happened with that company. Sure. I started out with a... Um, sort of a mid-sized company uh, that in hockey, um, for one, was a real dominant enterprise at the time. And uh, we morphed into a variety of different, it was really basically the same agency that I've worked with from day one and continue to this day. But we, um, we, we morphed into progressively larger size companies eventually with a company that went public, uh, became Live Nation, which is now the biggest concert promoter. Eventually, the, uh, um, eventually the, uh, the, the, the Live Nation spun off its sports business and a lot of the people that had come together uh, eventually went their separate ways or went to other agencies as I uh, and then, um, and, and then, you know, just kind of went from there. Right. And so, um, and then, so obviously, so Puck Agency really kind of is a, a splinter off of, of the, what was SFX Hockey and the Marquee Group and that, right? Uh, yeah. Athletes and Arts. So, yeah. Yeah, it's been really interesting because I've seen the the business, the sort of, the, if you want, the corporate side of the business from a variety of different angles, from a mid-sized company to a large publicly traded company towards now, which is probably for the last 15 or 16 years running our own shop. And um, it, there's a variety of benefits. When you're part of a bigger or operation, you can tap into the resources um, we did a lot more marketing. We had, we had some decent marketing capabilities. 
uh, for players. There's not a whole lot of marketing in hockey. So um, at the same time, as an independent operator, I find it it's really the front and center focus of the client himself and uh, our ability to, to really hone in on the details of what we need to provide our, our clients uh, and the service that we need to focus on is, is really the front and center. I don't spend a whole lot of time, you know, having meetings about uh, more global kinds of things. And uh, for me, uh, at, at least for this time period, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been the best way to approach the agent business. I see. And so obviously you, you, you got your, your law degree and, uh, and I read also that your wife is an attorney. So how important is that in, in terms of what you do, Jake? You know, is that, you know, obviously some agents, you know, have the law degree, some don't. Just curious, you know, where you stand on that. Well, I think what's happening, uh, I had this conversation with a friend of mine the other day where uh, when, uh, I mean, he, he was a general manager on, on the other side of the, the table when I first started. He was one of the very, very few. He had a PhD, um, oh. one of the very few uh, college educated people in, the, in, 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 in the world that I was in and dealing with. Right. Um, now you've gone from that extreme to the other extreme where the value of education, the value of uh, law oriented education, the value of uh, marketing, uh, sports marketing, which is um, some uh, of the expertise you see from people coming in. Uh, I think that the cutting edge, um, of course, you're dealing with management people all the time. So the question is, if you're dealing with those people, what kinds of skills do you need? in order to be able to effectively represent your client when you're dealing with those people. And I think that uh, a lot of the management, I'm finding that a lot of the management people that are coming into the game are much more educated, have much more solid uh, backgrounds. And uh, that makes it more challenging to, to deal with people like that. Um, you know, they, they, they can make coherent arguments yeah. Um, it's not based on yelling and screaming and a lot of personal insults or things along those lines. It's really well thought out, um, creative arguments that are based on facts. And, uh, I think when you're dealing with that, you have to rise to the challenge. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so hockey, it seems to me, and, and guys feel free to jump in, you know, you can either put your hand up or just jump in. Don't, you know. This, this isn't a, I mean, a Dave uh, J thing, so please feel free. Um, but um, it's, it seems like agents really kind of pick a sport and stick to the Scott Boris is baseball guy. We know that, you know, we know Lee Steinberg is football. Um, we do know a couple who cross over. Maybe they're part of a bigger agency. But um, hockey, obviously, for you is, is, is your main thrust. Um, has there ever been any, any other sport that you've dabbled in? I'm, I'm unclear on that. Um, I have done uh, a few, I have represented athletes in a few other sports. Um, there was always an overlap. Um, there was always an overlap um, for tennis, particularly for whatever okay. reason, a bunch of my clients had contacts there. Um, and, uh, and that type of thing. So, um, but, and, and I did do a little bit of uh, a representation of, of some football players early on, but what I found is it was really hard to, it, it this takes all your energy to focus full steam ahead on the clients and their, and, and, and their needs. And so I, I think that um, it's pretty tough nowadays. I mean, back when agents first started, a lot of the pioneers and um, you know, the, the Mark McCormick's and, and Donald Dell's people uh, that started some of the bigger um, agencies uh, at the, at the early inception of, of the sports representation business, they they were marketing companies and they could 
um, they can provide those services, but I think it's pretty hard um, for individuals uh, to focus on more than one sport. And it's also impossible. Like you cannot be, let's say it's spring training down in Florida or Arizona in, in baseball and then be, you know, in Toronto or Minnesota or Boston uh, recruiting hockey players or representing them or, or meeting with teams about their needs. Right. So I, I think that's, I think that's, uh, I think it's a pretty tough task and I don't really know anybody. There were a few people um, that are still hockey agents that I knew were in other sports, uh, but I don't, I don't think they've been able to sustain that. They've had to choose one sport or another. Gotcha. Well, it makes sense, but it seems to me like, and we've had this conversation before, because like I told you, we, we had laid law on earlier and, and he's such a good guy and he, he dabbled in the age of business as well as uh, doing some other things after his pro career was over. But um, and Tom has always got some great stories, but um, here's actually a very good question that one of the students said, and I appreciate it is because obviously hockey is an international uh, sport. You're dealing with a lot of international uh, athletes. So what is it like, when, you know, when you're representing players from so many different countries I mean, is there a difference? U.S., Canada, Sweden, Russia, all that? I mean, obviously, language barrier, but what else? Well, there's a big difference between uh, Nordic Scandinavian countries um, and Russia, a huge difference, Econ socioeconomically, um, language. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, Finns and Swedes typically learn English, whereas Russians, I think, typically don't. Um, there, there are huge differences. I, I have felt that that's one of the biggest challenges that, that I've enjoyed and, and been able to meet head on. Um, and, and I think that players, when, if you can picture yourself going to a totally foreign uh, country where they don't speak the language, the food's different, the, the people you're dealing with are different, completely different. Um, and surviving, I think in those cases, and then, and then you, you need, you needing as the athlete, somebody to pursue your business interests. Um, I think there's been cases where people didn't know what the relationship with me was going to be from day one and vice versa. Uh, but you know, what has come out of that, um, in some cases have been, you know, I've, I've had the, the pleasure to, to represent players that are in the hockey hall of fame. Um, people that I met when they were 17, 18 years of age, not really knowing what they could achieve or accomplish and for them to be Hall of Fame players. Um, that's been an enormous challenge and, and also one that I'm, I'm quite proud of because I think that the needs of those players, uh, they're different from the needs of North Americans. Uh, not to say that, that, that both don't have needs, they both do, but uh, the kinds of things that you're doing for those players is, is pretty significantly different, actually. Interesting. So I'm going to open it up to the, to the floor here in a second, Jay, for questions. That, uh, so, but it, it just seems to me like, um, you know, like I said, uh, hockey players seem to be, I mean, and because I dealt with them in, 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 college, in working in college athletics as well, they seem to be a pretty good group, but obviously it's more than just a player you're dealing with. Uh, management, management of teams, um, um, the league, the collective bargaining stuff. So, uh, you know, how difficult is it to stay on top of all that? So, I mean, is that a constant grind for you? I mean, because obviously, you know, those things are, first of all, the changes we, we just saw uh, NHL GM had to step down for reasons and we won't get into that, but I mean, there are changes on organization and, and, and it, are there teams that you would prefer to deal with? So it's, it's not a, I don't feel like for me, it's a constant grind because I've been doing it for a long enough time. And so I feel comfortable that the guidance I give to players um, is one based on experience. And I often say to players, you know, there's not much that's going to happen to you that I haven't dealt with previously. And so I don't find it to be a grind. I do find that it would be really hard. Obviously everyone has to, you know, the conundrum is that everyone has to learn somewhere. Uh, you just don't want to learn at the expense of, of somebody that's paying you a substantive amount of money for, for what should be solid advice. Um, and there's a, there, there's, there are a whole lot of disconnects in all that. 
Um, but leaving that aside, I think that, that um, you know, that there's just, uh, there is just a good feeling when you can, um, when you can give people that kind of guidance based on that experience. But at the same time, you can't be complacent. You need to, you need to constantly improve uh, your practice. Um, you need to strive to be better. You need to strive to provide players with what they need in the future going forward, which may be different than what you did 10, 12, 15 years ago. Um, and, and, and players, I think players today do have more needs, but I think that that's, uh, that that's a good thing. Um, that, that means that, you know, things are developing, um, further in terms of them wanting to have people around them that, that, you know, that, that they, they demand the best. They are the best in the world at what they do. Yeah. Um, only, I don't know about what the numbers are in other sports, but it always strikes me that only 4,000 individuals have ever played in the NHL in the whole yeah. history of the league. And if you think about only 4,000 compared to all the people that try to do it, um, the current players are the best in the world at what they do. And they deserve to have the best, you know, doctors, trainers, coaches, managers, agents, they, they, they deserve to have the best people around them. So you, you need to provide the best service um, in, in all aspects of what you, of what you do with them. Yeah. I think for me, uh, one of the reasons why I appreciate the sport so much is, is one I never never played it. I think I, I I think I was on ice skates once in my life and and did not fare well. Therefore, no other return to the ice. But I mean, just the fact that what they're doing uh, is second nature. You know, I mean, it's it, you know, be like us running down the street. Where like, you play, but I mean, you know, running and playing is you know that's you know, but to, to be on the ice, I mean, it's just I, I'm just amazed by that, and I really enjoy. I think to me, it's 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 the greatest game to watch. You know, in person, obviously, first and then on TV, if you if you know and understanding it, I know a lot of people who say, you know, I just can't follow the game. I don't know if you don't understand it like anything, you're not <laughs> you're not going to. Yeah. So uh, let's let's pause and let's open it up to the to the students, see what we have from them. Questions for Jay. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you go about recruiting international clients and um, are there their needs more difficult uh, like financially and legally whatsoever with contracts so i think it's a, it's an interesting process because when you first meet a player i don't think they really have a great idea of what it, what it is that you're going to actually do for them um you know a lot of them haven't yet started earning money um they're not terribly um sophisticated when it comes to um contracts or uh, financial stuff or tax considerations or uh, endorsements. They, they don't really have a good feel for what it is that you're going to actually do. A lot of them just, you know, they go off word of mouth, they go off reputation, things along those lines. When I, it was, it was really, um, I, I always had uh, Europe and still do have a strong European presence. Uh, and that has changed in terms of the recruiting. Um, and probably the most uh, challenging, fun, sort of James Bond-like experiences that I had were going to Russia in the early 1990s to recruit players because it was, uh, you know, communism had just fallen. Uh, people, were, there, there's movies about it if you wanna, if you wanna check it out. Um, there's some really interesting ones about about. Uh, um, what it was like just after the Soviet Union collapsed in Russia and what the hockey world was like. And the head of the Federation in Russia was gunned down in the streets. I mean, it was really like a wild west scenario. And, but it was a lot of fun. You know, you look back on that and say, wow, that was a great experience. Um, it's not quite like that anymore. Um, and in fact, with a lot of the European presence that we have nowadays, we have people over there that recruit the players and they pretty much handle that aspect of it. And then we take care of the players uh, when they come to North America. So um, it's not quite as, you know, cloak and dagger as it was when I, you know, when I first started. 
but I, but I, I truly treasure those experiences. I wish I had more. I wish I had an iPhone back then because I could have taken a lot a lot of really good pictures of a lot of things that would be hard for you to believe. Sorry about that. That's my that's on me. Um, yeah. So I was just saying that. Um, you know, the, the experience in Russia made me think of and you having worked, you know, with her knowing her Brooks and these guys may only know it, you know, through the movie Miracle. You know, we, I, I was certainly I was young, but, you know, I was alive for 1980 when they when they told the miracle. Um, ha, was their reaction as devastating as we think it was in losing that game to the Americans? Did it hold, um, is it something that they just they still, or do they yeah. just ignore it and say these guys got lucky? I mean, come on. Well, it, it wasn't. Uh, if you think about it, it wasn't really a big thing for them. Um, they were a hockey juggernaut. They had won, you know, all the Olympic games practically, um, all the World Championships. Um, they had great players. And this was like a blip on the screen. And it wasn't something that you really, you really raised in conversation. Because yeah, okay. as, as, as important as it was to us as Americans, it was not really that important to them. It was a loss. So it was a little hard to get much feedback on that. I think they always knew that. I think they always knew deep down that it was a, it was a feather in our cap. Um, yeah. But not something that was discussed a whole lot. Yeah, well, even even Herb said, I mean, according to the you know movie, it's like if we play them ten times, they might win nine. I mean, so everybody knew, every single player, every single coach knew this was a, a better team, the great probably the one of the greatest team on the planet at the time. But um, therefore, the uh, you know the miracle um, mantra. But um, I digress. Who else has a question for Jay? I do. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, my camera is. Uh... It's terrible and my internet is poor. No um, Jay, I'm a huge Herb Brooks fan. Um, so I'm going to ask the question, what was it like um, interacting with him and working with him? Uh, well, for me personally, it was it was an incredible experience. Um, I was 20 years old when I met him and worked for him. Um, he re the interesting thing for me was he really he, he really didn't utilize video very much for somebody who had he, he, he the, I would say the two components, Rachel, of her Brooks that were just amazing was his tactical understanding of the game was as good, if not better than anyone I've ever met. And the other part of it was that his psychological he was a psychology major in school. His psychological ability to motivate and understand players um, was just so incredible. And not, you know, just like walking around a room and talking about culture. Like he could, he knew how to get the most out of each one of his players. And that wasn't just in the Olympics. That, that was across the board. And sometimes it, it got under the skin of certain players, but it was a real big motivator. And for me, what was kind of interesting was here I was at 20 kind of providing him with some material that he hadn't really spent a whole lot of time thinking about. And uh, at the time that I met him, his family actually had moved back to Minnesota. Um, and he was just here. He was in New York by himself. And so a lot of times he would spend hours with me, like two, three, four hours after practice. And he would look at the work that I. And, you know, sometimes I was, because it was such tedious and laborious work, I was always so far behind on the video. So I might be watching a game from November and it was already January. And he'd say, well, why weren't, why are we doing it that way? Why were we doing it so well then? And now we're not doing it as well. Look at this guy, look at that. Like it was just a complete education. Um, and he didn't hold back either. I mean, I, I was, you know, I was on, I was on the management side of things, coaching side of things. So he wasn't afraid to share a lot with me, but uh, it was definitely behind the scenes and a behind the scenes look at um, how he approached the game, what his thought processes were. It was amazing. I mean, I, I, 
I think maybe as you get older, you, you sort of have a lot of nostalgia for people who early in your life had a big impact. Uh, but I can't quite honestly say that I've come across anyone that's even close. Um, and I did have quite a few mentors and people whose relationships today I value quite a bit, but I still don't put them in that category. Wow. Great, great question. Great answer. Anybody else for Jay? I have a question. Go. I was just curious why you think the NHL has such a problem marketing their players. Like I know I watch hockey a lot, so I know like the main, more of the people, but like they have such an issue marketing their bigger name players. And why do you think that's, that's a problem? Uh, there are a variety of reasons for it. I think first and foremost, it's quite honestly on, on the players. Um, the players have a culture that's not me first, which is a good thing. Um, it's just not a terribly good thing for marketing. Oh. Um, you know, they're, they're team oriented people. They don't like to, I think in part too, because of the Canadian culture, which is very passive and more reserved and not people who are out front and center uh, a lot of the time. Uh, it's not a particularly, um, um, it's not part of their, you would, you would be seen as sticking out if you tried to stick out as an individual. And so I, I, I think that that's partly cultural. Uh, with Europeans, it's always been super hard to, to market those players. Um, there's not a lot of crossover, although I think there've been some great personalities. I mean, I think about Yaramir Yager, Alexander Ovechkin does some marketing, I guess you could say. He's one of the greatest players that's ever played. Um, but the marketing in hockey just has, and and the other part of the reason is because there just isn't a good thrust um, from the people internally. It's If you read a lot about the NBA, even though Gary Bettman came out of the NBA, the NBA has been a much more player-centric league. And from a marketing standpoint, I think it's served them much better. Um, and the proof is in the pudding in terms of what's occurred in the last 25 years. Um, relative to the economics of the NBA versus the N economics of the N NHL. Um, but, you know, if you're looking at it from your vantage point, it's probably that way with a lot of other sports where the marketability of certain football players is, I mean, football and hockey, um, you know, economically football's by far, football is by far uh, the greatest revenue producer of any sport. Um, in North America, certainly, and globally. Um, but I, I think it's, um, it's, it's a cultural thing. And I also don't think that there's a lot, like there isn't a lot of support um, from people internally. Um, and, and I guess it would be the Players Association agents, other people who are responsible for it. Um, who don't really have that thrust. And uh, it's really a good question as to why, uh, but it, it's, I hope that I've at least given you in part the answer. Wouldn't you think that the league, I mean, would, would want to up their efforts and to obviously, you know, the TV packages and stuff like that are, are part of it, but, um, you know, it, it's their sport and it's, you know, it is obviously, as much as I like it, and it's, you know, it, it is well behind the NBA and the NHL and MLB is not as great as it used to be, but it's, uh, you know, at least in this country, it, it's, it's not, it's not the first sport you think of. So how do you, how do you, I don't know the answer. I'm just wondering how, if you're, if I'm working for the league, how do, how do you address that? How do you try to fix that? Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier. You know, if you go to a live game, it's pretty hard not to like the sport. I mean, the speed, the quickness, the, I mean, it, hockey's like jazz. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. you know, there's such certain flow to the game that it doesn't exist in any other sport. I'm biased because I, I like hockey the most of any sport. I, I, I think it's a much more exciting game than football, personally. Mm -hmm. I think the object in football, football is like a war, a war of attrition. It's just two guys going up against each other to see who can beat the other guy up. There's not a lot of creativity. Um, there's creativity in plays, but, you know, there's not as much creativity. 
um, hockey is such a free form game um, that's exciting based on that speed and the speed and creativity at which at, at the level of which the game is played. It's really hard if you go to a game live for whatever reason that has not translated into the economic success. Uh, although, you know, the, the league economically has, has uh, continued to improve. It's continued to be on the upswing. Um, but I, 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 I think the fact that they haven't been player centric has been to their detriment. Mm. Uh, in fact, the league has, the league's strategy over the last 25 years has essentially been to cut their labor costs as much as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard to cut the labor costs and then go ahead on, 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 you know, on the one hand, and then on the other hand say, well, we don't value what we pay this guy, but he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. So um, that's, that's something that's the league, in my opinion, has been defined by in the last 25 years, which has been to cut their labor costs. I mean, it's worked for them economically. Their franchise values have skyrocketed. Um, but has, but overall, has it been the best thing for the growth and development of the game? Probably not. Yeah, interesting. I mean, the league, and so talking about the league uh, headquarters and, and the NHL, um, they were, in my opinion, ahead of the ahead of the curve on the digital media side. In fact, they were really good. And, and, and people were hiring NHL media or whatever the hell they call it, you know, to, to, to do uh, stuff for them. So, um, and, and by the way, you know, full disclosure for our students, especially the head of the PR department for the NHL is a graduate of this program. So, you know, obviously I would hope you connect to, you know, people that we have uh, from the program who are graduates to LinkedIn or whatever, but um, Jay, um, as, as somebody who's heading an agency, you know, what, tell us a little bit about the day-to-day -day of that. I mean, you obviously you have, you know, do you guys split up the clients? Do you, do you oversee your, are there individual agents that you manage? How does that work for you? Um, well, it's, it's, it's never been constant, but I'm involved with every single player um, to varying degrees. Um, we're not a particularly large group. We have about seven or eight people on staff. Um, as I said, from the outset, since I've been an independent operator, it's been just, what do I wake up? And the first thing I think about is, okay, what do I have to do for player X, Y, or Z? And taking care of those needs for them is, is, um, is front and center. And so I, I, I you know, like I said, I, I enjoy that because I think that the responsiveness to those players is really what you're, is what you're here for. Um, as I have gotten older and more experienced at the same time, I've also, you know, this is a, it's a business that requires a lot of energy. Um, and you need to be out in the field. You need to be at games. You need to be seeing people. You need to be front and center. It's been actually difficult during COVID. Uh, it's been a little bit easier this year, but last year was certainly difficult to, to see people on a regular basis. And, um, and when you're recruiting, that's something that's really critical is, is having the, the presence and the, and the exposure. Uh, and, the young guys that work with me, I mean, they're, they're, we, the recruiting has changed a lot. When I first started, we recruited players out of college. Uh, now we recruit players well before they get to college. And uh, so, so the young guys that work with me, um, they're in the rink um, every weekend um, at youth tournaments, 15, 16, 17 year old players. Uh, and it's constant. It's constant. That part of it's a grind. Yeah. I would say that. Interesting. Interesting that you bring that up because I have a question. Uh, you mentioned young players, 15, 16 years old. And obviously, um, I know you don't have your head in the sand, but you, you know about the NIL stuff that's come down the road. And I guess my question is, will you or have you represented or will you represent college students? As they, well, we, as they get into we, this. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I'll, I would answer it twofold. One is we, we've always been representing college age players. We, you know, the, the NCAA deems it that right. we should be the family advisor. And, and we don't charge the players and they don't make any money. Although now they can pursue name, image, and likeness. Um, I don't know what the role is for the agent in name and image and likeness, frankly. I, I think that you're going to see a lot of $20, $25 deals um, across the board, right. um, which are not going to yield a whole lot of money for agents. Um, but they will benefit the people who are on the receiving end of the money. I think it's going to be a more democratized, widespread um, uh, displacement of money. Um, so rather than one player getting the lion's share of it, uh, I think you'll see a lot of really small little deals and, you know, those could be generated from the internet, Instagram, you know, a myriad of different ways, cameo, um, you know, those kinds of like little nuts and bolts kinds of appearances, which, uh, are great for athletes. I mean, it, you know, what I said before about 4,000 players playing in the NHL and the whole history of the NHL to be a college athlete takes a huge commitment, huge and a huge amount of sacrifice. And it's never lost on me. And so the fact of the matter is if those players need to support themselves for them to work at summer camps, for them to get endorsements, if there's interested, if there's interest in who their name and likeness is, there's no question if you're going to the university of Michigan, to watch a football game or a basketball game, you are also going to watch those players that are on the team or any other school for that matter. Yeah. Interesting. Um, more um, questions and, for and, and, yeah, Go ahead, Jay. Just one thing to add. And yeah. by the way, when you're buying those tickets, you're buying the tickets to go watch those student athletes play. Right. So, sorry. No, that's good. Anybody else questions for Jay? Yeah, uh, what do you think led to the NHL lockout and how did things change for you in the process after that? That's a really good question, Braden. Um, all the questions have been good, actually. Um, but but uh, which the, the question I would have to throw back is which lockout? Because we, <laughs> we had four of them. Um, but I think yeah. you mean the one in 2004 or five, which canceled yeah. the whole season. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that has cast a huge sh shadow on, on the industry. Um, the salary cap probably transferred, by my last count, like something between 12 and $15 billion from the owner's, from the, from, from the player's pocket to the owner's pocket over over that 17 or 18 year period, $10 billion that the owners have received versus the players. Um, and so, and this is a business that, you know, only generates $5 billion a year total for everybody. So $10 billion and, and you know, if you look at what franchises were worth I'm guessing franchises were worth in 0405, like some of them 200,000, 300,000, uh, sorry, 200 million, 300 million. Um, now, some of them are worth, you know, billions, one, two billion dollars, perhaps Toronto Maple Leafs, New York Rangers. Um, you know, these entities are, are worth a staggering amount of money. Um, the New York Rangers had a salary cap. The New York Rangers had a salary cap probably on the order of 80, 85 million in 2004, five. Um, they're all, I mean, they're before the salary cap, that's yeah. what their, that's what their salaries amounted to. The salary cap then went down when it was first instituted, it was 40 million. It was 39.6 million. Um, so when your salaries were cut in half, essentially for certain teams, just yielded a, a whole, you know, ticket prices weren't cut in half. <laughs> yeah. The revenue, the revenues from television and other uh, like 
uh, 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 line items were were not cut in half. So the money went right to the to the owner's bottom line. And um, I don't know. I'm 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 a player's advocate, and I think that it's been really hard to watch that happen, knowing that players and this the highest played player in the in the game today is Connor McDavid. Uh, he's probably paying playing for half of what he's worth. Mm. You know, his salary is like twelve million dollars, and he probably should yield twenty four, twenty five million dollars a year. That's what his true worth is. So it's really hard to see players not get their true market value. Um, and that's occurred over a long period of time. Now we've watched it, and there's never really been an event that's allowed the pendulum to start swinging the other way. I remember in the early 90s or, you know, we, we, I mean, we had certain players whose salaries escalated quite, quite quickly. Um, and the owners and managers would complain that the sport was going to be ruined and that the pendulum had swung too far. Well, we're now 25 years after that fact, and the reality of it is the pendulum hasn't even started to swing back. Um, you know, you're starting to see it in other, I, I track what goes on in labor. Uh, of course, this is considered high priced labor, uh, but baseball traditionally has always had a strong union. Hockey had a strong union up until 04, 05, and the union was broken at that time. If you look, if you see what, what happened, you know, labor is, is gaining a foothold in the United States again now after COVID. Um, <clears throat> And it'll be interesting to see if, um, you know, un unfortunately, what, what it tends to, to result in is management just taking utter advantage of, of labor and, and being so egregious in what they do that labor finally says, we've had enough. Um, but, but, but hockey has not been in that space in the last 25 years. When does this collective bargaining agreement run to? Do we know? So. Uh, well, they just agreed to another extension of it. Um, okay. And it takes us right through COVID. Um, you know, there was a, I guess you could say there was a, it was an utter guess on everyone's part. Um, <laughs> it wasn't that much of a guess for the league. Although I guess if the league had shut down for two years, they, the players had a guarantee that they were going to get no matter what. But um, it seems like it, it's at least in the, in, the, in the scope of where they were, it was a relatively fair deal uh, to get the game started again. But where it goes from there remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, Questions for Jay? Yeah, I have a question. Um, what's like the most unexpected thing that, that like since you started your career, what's like the most unexpected thing that's happened? To me personally, I mean? Sure, yeah, for like while you were like in, while you're in the industry. Um, I, I can't think of any one thing um, that's been unexpected. And I suppose in that sense, the business that I'm in has stayed relatively constant. Um, there are hardly any days that go by when I don't get surprised by certain players' uh, questions or requests or things along those lines. Um, I have been, I guess, going back to what I said earlier, I, I think I've been when you meet somebody for the first time and they're 17 or 18 years old and they don't speak the language and you can't communicate and you're just looking at that person sort of across the room, you know, you sort of naturally form prejudicial judgments about whether they're going to succeed or not mm. by their body language or things along those lines. And um, so to see how their careers ultimately play out, I guess that, at times has been the most surprising. You, you really didn't know somebody who was quiet, who didn't say that much, uh, really had that in him to take it 
three, four, five steps, you know. I guess the other thing maybe too is it's it's always been it's always been nice to look interesting, I guess, maybe better word than nice, but it always been interesting to look back on players and, and have dialogue with them when they're, when they're, when they're much older after their careers are over and ask them, you know, how did you think about this? Or how did you think about that? And the ability to kind of reflect on things because it's, um, it's a frenetic paced business and um you know, you're often making decisions on the fly. I mean, you want to be prepared for those decisions. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, you know, it's, you know, negotiations could drag on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then all of a sudden within two days, you have to make a decision or within Mm -hmm. half a day, you need to make a decision. Um, So, so there, there is a, a pressure and a phonetic pace to the business, but I think looking back on those kinds of things, you, you know, you, you sort of say, wow, I, I really thought this one would turn out differently, or I really thought that one would turn out uh, differently. Or, you know, occasionally I've had some tragedies that, that have mm-hmm. happened to certain players that have taken their careers away from them. And, you know, you, you, you certainly, that's, that's in and of itself very surprising and devastating mm-hmm. at the same time. That, uh, that's interesting that you said that because I was going to dovetail off that question and follow up with this uh, because I we have a uh, an agent who's coming to speak with us in a couple of weeks who's spoken to the classes before and he shall share stories about you know getting texts and calls at three o'clock in the morning guys are in jail guys are this guys are that and waking up every morning with just a you know a fear of what's happened the night before and I mean if that doesn't turn you off from doing what he does I don't know what would but my question for you is, and you just said something, you know, related to it is, you know, how much of the time did you sp- have you had to spend on stuff like that? I mean, it, it, listen, stuff happens. These are young kids. Young kids tend to do stupid things. Um, you know, uh, does anybody here know um, who Pelly Lindbergh is other than Jay? Pelly Lindbergh actually gets a, a mention in, in Miracle. He's actually the goalie of, I think, the Swedish team. Um, and, and so Pelly Lindbergh was a very good goalie, uh, played for the Philadelphia Flyers. And I remember this like it was yesterday because I was at a Buffalo Bills game up in New York. And we heard that Pelly Lindbergh had been killed in a one car car. I had a Porsche was driving way too fast. Rainy Street. I think it was 23, maybe 24. Anyway, so stuff like that, Jay. I mean, obviously, you know, things are going to happen, but, you know, you know, maybe to the previous question, you know, what's the thing where you just wake up and go, man, I wish that didn't happen to that kid. Yeah, I had it happen. I've had it happen several times, unfortunately, but um, very unfortunately, uh, tragically. Um, But this past summer, we lost a player who was 24 years old as well, uh, who was um, killed by uh, fireworks on July 4th. Mm. Uh, player for the Columbus Blue Jackets yeah. and um, you never really I mean obviously somebody losing a life that young of course I, I said it to a, a close friend of mine who was his his junior coach uh, it never happens to the bad people it always mm. happens to good people and uh, in his case a great real really thoughtful young man um, incredibly bright uh, incredibly talented and uh you know you get that phone call uh john davidson was the general manager or sorry the president of the columbus blue jackets he just come back from working with the, the new york rangers and i got the call from him at five in the morning and um it's just it, it, there's no words to describe that i i at the same time i i've taken some comfort in his family which i who i never really met um because he just he came to north america he's latvian and he came to north america when he's 18 and i really only dealt with him never dealt with his family um his family obviously have been quite involved in um the things that have occurred after his passing um and and there's a myriad of them Mm. um but they've been incredibly strong um 
incredibly strong people. And so I, I really value that relationship now yeah. uh, quite a bit. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss and I'm sorry, we were very sorry when you know, my son and I read that story, but you know, it's funny because my first reaction was, you know, when would these freaking guys learn to stop for around fireworks? And it turns out like I was completely wrong. And this guy, and in fact, I think he actually saved some people because he, he got in the way of something that had misfired. And, and, and so not to, not to dwell on that, but I mean, he was, he was actually a hero. So um, any other questions for Jay? Um, yeah, as far as like the difference in tax rates when, when signing with an organization, whether it be a different state or country, is that part of the no negotiation with the teams and contracts? Like, do they take account the tax rate that players will have to play on what they'll pay in their contract? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you a little bit of a long-winded answer to that. I, 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 I want to circle back um, a little bit, the reason I said that, that, that your question about the lockout is such a good one is because it's, it's amazing to me today, unfortunately, how little education players, current players have about what occurred. Um, they just play and they're, they're, they need to be focused on what they do. And I get that, but very, very few of them really have a good historical understanding of what's occurred. And uh, that's to their detriment for sure. Um, I will add one other thing and then I'll get to the tax part of it. The, the, the salary cap has also sterilized the contract negotiations quite a bit. Um, you used to be able to negotiate all kinds of different uh, bonuses. Um, you could negotiate for other benefits for your player, um, team bonuses, uh, individual bonuses. Um, option years on contracts, voidable option years, uh, a lot of different things that have been taken out of the equation. I, I have found that to be um, unfortunate because it took a lot of the creativity out of the negotiations. Um, but the tax aspect is one thing that still remains, although you, know, the, you pay the tax based on the team, you pay the tax based on your residents. Uh, so, for example, if you're a resident of Las Vegas, you pay 0% in state tax. Um, but you can't theoretically live in Las Vegas and play for the New York Rangers uh, or the New York Islanders. You, you know, so, so your residence really dictates. Uh, but at the same time, like when players sign free agents, you can get signing bonuses. Signing bonuses could be considered... Um, uh, you know, a different kind of income uh, and therefore taxed at the, at the, the not, the, the, you know, the, let's say the Vegas zero per, or Nashville or, or Florida or uh, are, are Texas are all places that have in the NHL that have no state tax. Um, so there's a little bit of creativity there, but, but quite honestly, not, not nearly as much as there used to be. Uh, having said that, we, we do, uh, we do provide full service to our players and do their taxes also, um, which also has become uh, similarly a lot more uh, straightforward and less creative than it used to be. There's not a whole lot of deductions. Um, the tax code that was instituted when Trump was president uh, took away, surprisingly, took away a lot of advantages for professional athletes. Um, that they previously uh, enjoyed, and uh, I don't think I don't see it coming back too quickly either. Hmm. Interesting, guys. Questions for Jay? Anybody else? Yep. All right, Jay. Any any last words of? Uh encouragement or what you would suggest or recommend for these guys starting out their careers um, what you would encourage them to, to maybe some skill sets or something that you feel is important or what you're still teaching jay you're still doing your teaching adjunct teaching? no I, I i i used to teach a group um, of students um 
uh, sports ma- in a sports management program. Um, so I appreciate what you guys are going through. I, I, and I, I can pretty much vividly recall being in your, in your shoes. I, I personally took the approach that I was going to get really aggressive and, and get a head start in my professional career when I was pretty young. Um, and that, that should be up to each individual as to, to, to decide that, but it, it it worked out well for me, and I think that I can say that since I I have been representing players since 1985, which is an awful long time, um, that I, I I truly wake up enjoying what I do. And I know a lot of people say you should look. I, I think a lot of people give you advice that you should enjoy what you do. It's really truly hard to find something um, that you're going to enjoy doing. Um, that's called work. I always say work's a four letter word. Um, cause for most other people, it is a four letter word. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I really truly enjoy, uh, what I do and have fun doing it. And I, I think I have found, although I wasn't, I wouldn't say that I was naturally gifted at it. I had to learn and work hard to acquire the skills. Um, I would say I was a shy person when I was your age. And so that wasn't exactly the easiest thing to do. Like you need, most agents need to be pretty open and gregarious and talkative and persuasive and strong advocates for people. And so I, I, I don't know that the, the skill set came naturally to me. Um, but I'm also at a point where in my career where I don't have to do it financially, but I still want to do it. Um, because I enjoy it. And it's the only job I've ever had too. So um, uh, it may speak to the fact that I'm not sure I'd be good at anything else either, but, 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 but I think that, um, you know, if, if you can, if you can think about that and try to grab onto, um, you know, a sphere, I, I, I would focus less on the financial aspects of it and more on the, um, the, the financial aspects will take care of themselves. Like in other words, salary, what, what, what you're making from for money. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 I mean, and, you know, obviously I, I understand the pressures of being a student and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and the pressures of living day to day. The young people I work with surprisingly probably a, approach it a little bit differently than me. I think they look at their experience as a lifestyle their work is a lifestyle for them. And it wasn't for me. I separated work and family and, and, and tried to keep some elements of, of privacy. I'm sure they do too, but, but to, to a much lesser degree, I feel like they're, you know, one of our agents is on Instagram 24 seven he's watching people and then he's tagging them in Instagram and he's showing them how much he's watching them. And, you know, I find all that to be great. Um, but I feel like, and, and it may be good and it may be good advice for any one of you is they don't look at it like a job. They look at it as a lifestyle. And in that sense, uh, I think it feels a lot less like work in Mm -hmm. that, in that, uh, in that approach. Interesting. Um, last thing, and I'll let you go, Jay. Um, so a lot of agents I ask this to, they'll just say, no, no, I don't. You know, I represent athletes, so I don't root for a team. And obviously, I from your from your bio, I'm assuming you grew up a Ranger fan, and and uh, so do you root for a team still, or do you just say no, no, I don't, no, I'm, I got my guys. Yeah, I I I did grow up a Ranger fan, um, and my dad still is a rabid Ranger fan, um, uh, and always has been. But but he's also he has also rooted for my players. Um, which has been interesting, but I, I, fantasy. <laughs> I, I have really given up rooting for, for teams and, and really zero in on rooting for my, for my clients. And I have in my own little stupid way, I think I've perfected that because I really <laughs> focus on, on what, what is necessary from, from their perspective. Um, but that's, that's what I do. Yeah. Well, as an unabashed Islander fan, I'll tell you, if you get any tickets, you can throw them my way since you don't, ah. 
There you go. <laughs> All right, Jay, thank you so much. We appreciate it. You're a good man. Oh, by the way, you have an open invitation. Next time this class runs to teach it, because <laughs> you'd, you'd be much better at it than I am. Well, no, I hope you guys enjoy it, and I hope you guys, you know, find your true passions, whatever that may be. Thank you, Jay. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. you soon, pal. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Anything from me, guys? I guess it's one quiet group, I gotta tell you. All right. All right, I'll let you go. And then uh, I'll send the video tomorrow. Actually, reminds me to stop recording. <laughs>